Good afternoon. On behalf of Chromium Brand and Culture, we thank you for joining our webinar today, Financial Services, Map a Customer Experience and Build Loyalty. I'm pleased to introduce Peter Van Artrijk, co-founder and principal of Chromium, a brand strategy firm with offices in Washington, D.C. and San Francisco. Peter works with an organization's leadership to craft strategic branding initiatives to develop vibrant cultures and support durable brands. Thanks so much. Well, hello, everybody, uh, and welcome, Dennis, um, from, from Ottawa, up in beautiful Canada, Ontario and Canada. And uh, I'm from the Netherlands. Isn't that strange? And you're a Canadian. So welcome, Dennis. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here, Peter. Thanks for the invite. Well, and, and Dennis, just, just real quick for those that uh, don't know you, I know you're internationally uh, famous in terms of speaking and writing. Um, uh, for those that uh, probably know this, but MosleyWilliams.com is, is uh, Dennis's online office. Um, since 99, 1997, 20 years now, uh, Dennis, you've been working with financial services industries uh, in, in practice management, business development, and, and what our topic for today is creating and staging client experiences. Uh, kind of like today we're going to cover the what and the how and the why, um, that, that this is so critical for financial services and insurance organizations. So we'll get into that, Dennis, and, and certainly we need to explain um, uh, what is the experience economy for our, uh, our viewers. Um, but also what I'm interested in is how different it is than uh, what folks in, in, in financial services and insurance think uh, about service, like real-time service, um, and in some cases, essentially, no service or self-service that suddenly we have to bag our own groceries, we have to pump our own gas, we have to get money out of the ATM, never see a teller, that these kind of things where it's no service is what people want today. And for me, when I first uh, learned about this, this concept at a, a talk you gave, it was really for me like a sea change kind of event because I thought, I thought we were going to a world where people just wanted things faster. And you're saying, whoa, we got to slow down because people are looking for experiences, not faster service. So with that, mm -hmm. I, I'd like to have you maybe tell us what is the experience economy. Okay, well, fantastic. The experience economy is, first of all, not anything I invented. Um, I learned all about the experience economy through Joe Pine and Jim Gilmore, who wrote a book called The Experience Economy in the late 1990s. And in the late 1990s, what they argued was that what was emerging was a change in the very fabric of the modern economy where experiences and not goods and services would become, remember this is the late 90s, would become the predominant economic offering. So no longer goods and services, but instead experiences which are staged, individual, and unique and memorable events. And, and at the time, when, when my attention was first brought to this book, it was through someone in the audience who said, oh, you must be a big fan of the experience economy. I'll confess I'd never heard of it. It was only a couple of years old then at the time. And I was just talking about what I felt was really obvious, which was that at the time, people were not going to Starbucks just to buy the coffee. There was clearly something else of value there. So the experience economy refers to a new understanding of value where the value is in fact memorable events and the experience of the offering more so or at least equal to the offering itself. Okay. All right, let's stay with Starbucks because that's something I'm sure most of our viewers can relate with. And uh, it's also different than what, what they say they do, which is we provide intangible um, services and products, not tangible like coffee, but let's walk through Starbucks, maybe literally, um, mm -hmm. and how you how you describe that as like one of the ultimate experiences for customers, where where it's in, in the old days, you know, um, uh, I, not that long ago actually, you go to 7-Eleven or McDonald's and get coffee, get, get some coffee like really fast, you know, there wasn't really much of an experience, it was just like I have to get coffee, it's 79 cents, and now we go to Starbucks where, you know, we should call it five bucks instead of Starbucks, but it's this whole thing with our name on the cup and, and we're waiting in line. I think there's some lessons in all of that for everybody, but let's walk through that one so people can get their arms around what you mean by slowing down, staging, um, and taking more time. Okay, so this, this also touches on something you mentioned in your, in your initial preamble, which was this difference 
between service and experience. So if we all think about it this way, services are all about being efficient and effective. We, when we think, how do we improve the service, we think we're, we're all consumed with the offering, whether it's a cup of coffee, a tangible product, or an intangible product such as insurance. We feel that through better service means they can get information quicker, easier, faster. If you go to the Starbucks question, the idea is you'll bring more value through service if it's painless to get the product. Yeah. Take all the obstacles out so that almost you walk in, get the coffee, and boom, you're outside with it in your hand. What experience staging is about is different. What we're doing is we're extending. It's though as, as if I'm holding a cotton ball here in my hands, and that's the offering. We're stretching it out. We're extending the time that the client or the guest, as I like to say, gets to experience your offering. And in that way, standing in line at Starbucks is just part of the experience. And they take great pains not to make the lineup move quicker, but to make your time in the, in the lineup more enjoyable. And wow. so if I may, and I, I see you have something to say, if I may, if Starbucks were fixated on improving services, because the experience has nothing to do with the offering, if they wanted to improve the service, what they would do is at the point of sale where you order your coffee, which you can customize, and they put your name on it, customization, at the point of sale, they would widen the wicket, double the number of staff, so you could order your coffee and get it quicker. That's not what they do. They leave it the way that it is, they give you beautiful things to look at, beautiful coffee to smell, escapist language, a little bit of entertainment, a little connection, a little uh, you know commingling with your guests, etc. They slow lots it down. Lots, lots of tattoos uh, are along the way there too. <laughs> more and more. That's how you know how old you're getting. If That's you right. associate tattoos with convicts, you were probably born in the yeah. '70s or earlier. I love them. I love them. <laughs> so they slow it down. They slow it, slow it all down. A little pinch point. You're looking at other products, other things you might want to buy. Your name's on the cup. It's a whole, it's a whole thing. And you, you feel good about spending the five bucks. It took forever, maybe, but you walk out with your prize, and you, you have this experience. And maybe you have a whole tray of coffee for other people with their names on it. Yes, and not only because what they're doing is staging an experience. You're not actually leaving with a cup of coffee. What you're leaving with are two things. The coffee as memorabilia, as you walk down the street with it, it's, it's, it's like a gift from Starbucks. And the second is a gift. And the gift was could have been a memorable event in line, and it's Starbucks fulfilling sort of their promise of changing your life and creating this third space where you can just bring yourself together have something that's just for you, enjoy your time in the store, whether it's in the lineup and out the door, or in the lineup, to a really comfortable chair, to free Wi-Fi, to music that's wonderful. Yeah, right, right. So so there's lessons, the, the point I wanted you to, to go into this, and there's other examples you use, you use such as Cabela's and, and Grass Pro Shops and Disney World and American Girl Stores and all these places where you're going in and you, 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 you buy stuff, of course, and spend a lot of money, but you're also there for this experience, and you tell others about it, and it's this memorable thing. So, so it, so let's let's take that and now now say, and you got this question a lot from financial services people, you know, whether they're selling retirement planning or insurance products, life insurance, whatever it is, they say, you know what, we're not Starbucks, mm -hmm. we we sell an intangible. You know, we, we sell advice. Yes, we ultimately give them a policy, but they're not coming to us for stuff like that. They're coming to us for, they may not even want to talk to me. You know, I, I, I have a hard time, I, I don't even want to email my customers because I don't want to disturb them. You know, I, it's, it's crazy what I think in this business, people get wrapped around this whole idea of we're different. But, uh, but what you've written and said in the past is you're not, actually. And there's hmm. lessons experience economy, you, you must apply to your practice, right? Yeah. Okay, I'm <laughs> wishing this was like a five-hour webinar. <laughs> yes. So here's the thing. 
the question itself, in my opinion, is the answer, uh -huh. which is, well, of course you want to stage experiences. You sell intangible things. Experience staging is about leaving fingerprints on a person. You're trying to turn the intangible tangible. Mm. So you're trying to stage an event. Experience has nothing to do with the offering. And what experience is, is about engaging with your client and turning it into an event and all stages of this event. And what is an event? Very quickly, an event by definition, any event, is something you are looking forward to or at the very least anticipating. It's something that changes you in some way. And when you're finished, when it's over, you talk about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... So the idea of experience staging, going back to the idea of extending time and non-tangible, especially if you sell intangible products, you're looking at the various stages of your experience from attracting, or as my friend Kevin Dull, who's this fantastic guy I met at Experience Economy School, his Twitter handle is at IdeaFreak, and you want to look into him. Okay. As he said, he changes attracting to enticing, to entering your business to during their actual experience with the offering itself, to exiting, or if you will, transitioning in and transitioning out. These are all opportunities. Nobody should ever dread, ever, going to see a person who is responsible for their finances, their financial planning, their insurance. I mean, consider just for a moment the significance of that role in a person's life. You are the architect of my future and where I'm trying to go. How can that not be A, an, a meeting you want to attend, and B, as the person on this side of the desk, the provider and stager of the experience, the deliverer of the services. How can you not want to make, if, if, if your client on your way to your office went to Starbucks, and they accept and appreciate an experience getting a cup of coffee, how can you possibly believe they're not looking for an experience from you, and B, with all of that clay and opportunity to work with, why wouldn't you stage an experience to make the whole process of working with you something that is truly personal, memorable, changing, and something you feel compelled to speak about? I, it makes no sense. I think, I think at the root of those kinds of objections is cynicism. Yes. Because to, to stage an experience, like as you can see, I'm passionate about this subject. It's because yes. I want everybody to hang up the phone and do it. So to be passionate, you got to be passionate. You got to let everybody see it. So when you want to stage an experience that really matters, you're opening yourself up to being judged, and you're opening up yourself up to the risk that one of your clients or somebody's going to say, "Peter, what the hell are you trying to do here?" Or Peter, this is this makes no sense. That's scary. So I think at the heart of the reluctance is cynicism. I'm, I say that as an optimist, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. Yeah. Okay. So. So would you, let me just run this by you, Dennis. Do you think that a lot of folks who are in the sales business, um, again, I know that in your mind it's probably a terrible thing to say, but, but people always say, you know, nothing really happens until the sale is made. You know, um, we don't need marketing. This is a relationship business. You hear these things all the time. And what I, what I find is that a lot of these very successful businesses, especially the owners of those businesses, have their mind wrapped around new sales. Net new. Mm -hmm. you know, it's all about new, new, new. More, more people. And I find that some, when you break it down, sometimes they're like on a treadmill. You know, like do they have meaningful relationships with these customers, especially when they're in the business of, of protecting them in the future or, or their business, their lives or their families or their businesses for the future? Are they in a treadmill, or they really know? Are they really managing that risk in the future? And and my theory is, um, as an outside observer, is I think fewer and deeper relationships, which does mean more revenue per customer, mm -hmm. um, is a better path towards happiness for everybody and it allows you to create experiences. Is, is that a good thesis or do you think you can have tons of customers and this experience situation? Well, I think in some businesses you can have tons of, tons of customers and have this experience situation. Certainly Coca-Cola customizes their cans, have a Coke with Dennis. I've had people take pictures of them and send them around. They certainly have lots of customers. Do these individuals have good relationships or meaningful relationships? I'm going to say sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. 
but what I'm and are they always addicted to new products, etc.? This is what I think. What we are all struggling to do in business, and this could be a long answer, so I will police myself. Just what we are it. all struggling to do in business is bring two things to our clients. This first one is for my partner Tom, okay? Relevancy. He talks about all kinds of things that we talk about with our clients because the number one question is, are you relevant? The second question is value. And how is value defined? Your clients should it's, forget about the products. It's the entire thing. Do you bring value to your clients? So what we have to understand is as the, ex, the economy has shifted, the progression of economic value, again, covered in Joe and, uh, Joe and Jim's book, The Experience Economies, as we move through from the agrarian to the industrial to the service economy to experiences, not only is the offering changed, the understanding of value from where the client is. This is critical. I have a friend in the restaurant business. He sells goods, well, goods and services, but there's no difference. Yeah. He says value is when you put the french fries on the counter and they spill out. Yeah. And the yeah. customer looks and goes, wow, that's a lot of french fries. That's value if you sell french fries. If you sell services, as we discussed a few questions ago, what's the value of service? Efficiency and speed. Think about a place, think about going to get your, your oil change in, in your car. It costs $38, you don't even get out of your car, and they get it all done in 11 minutes. What you value isn't the price, what you value is 11 minutes. And that's great if you're in the business that sells services. But if you are in a business where you're staging experiences, where's the value? We've already yeah. agreed it's not speed. Two things, memorable events. It's where whatever the experience is engages us and delights us. I will leave it at that. And the second I will say is this. Nothing will be bought. I don't think marketing works. I don't think it does. I don't think you can invite people to places here. No. What you have is permission. We have permission from the people who tuned in today to reach out to them and say we'd be talking about this. That's what we have is permission. And we have to respect the trust that comes with that permission as we do and thank you to everyone. We hope you're enjoying this. Mm -hmm. But bombarding people, if you will, strangers to say come and listen to two people with unusual last names talk about something that sounds bizarre, that's not going to get you anywhere. Here's yeah. what's going to get you everywhere. Goods and services are commodities. Everybody's got them. They're fungible, meaning they're easily replaced by the identical. They compete on price. There is absolutely nothing interesting. There's nothing interesting about them. Here's what's interesting. The connection and the person and the experience that they stage. That's the story that they tell. So I honestly believe not only does experience staging and experience economy make sense to me on every level that there is, even in prospecting, even in business development, I think, are you crazy? There is nothing, nothing builds a business quicker than a story and people relate on stories. Facts tell stories, so that's, that's, that's never gone away. Okay. Well, yes, you do have a lot of passion, Dennis. That's why um, glad we're able to do this. Um, and, and one of the objections that, that you said has come, has come up with, um, with organizations trying to retool for this is like they say things like, we really don't have the staff to do this staging thing. Um, I actually think smart organizations are already doing experiences, bits and pieces of the of the uh, customer experience from, from being, when they're a prospect to a customer, maybe when they're renewing their stuff or whatever. There's these moments of, of I don't know what you call them, moments of truth, or there's moments where the service staff are doing certain things that, uh, you know, the bosses might say, well, that's kind of a nice to have. It's a nice, nice to have that we're taking a few extra moments to learn about their family. Or to say, hey, we noticed you didn't buy this. This might be good for your family to protect your family. So it's like a the cross sell thing. Or if you're a financial advisor, the annual check in kind of thing that seems to be just in the way of another new sale. Um, when in fact, mm -hmm. those are moments I think you're saying here that are that we should look at as organizations. Look at every step of the of the thing here and say, where can we create experiences? That's one way you can do it is use existing staff to just kind of rethink 
what they're doing in their companies, what their role is, what, what, and, and a step further is you'd say that that makes them better employees, happier employees, because they're, they're part of a bigger purpose, right? Not just making the boss man money, but really helping people. There it is. Okay, so yes, there's, there's a whole lot there. Yeah. There, well, there's a ton, but I mean, I went to school for the experience economy for five days. Okay, five days, like eight till five. Then we'd have dinner, and that was part of school too. And then after <laughs> dinner, all the students would sit around, and sometimes with with uh, one night Jim Gilmore sat with us, and we talked experience economy till ten o'clock at night. And I think about it all day long, and it's fascinating. And I could go to school again. Like, it's a huge, huge subject. So tough to give short answers, but here it is. You started with an assumption. And it's a dangerous assumption that people make, which is, oh, I, I can't afford the time or, or, or uh, expense of this. Okay, nobody said it was expensive, and nobody said it was expense, uh, pardon me, time consuming. In all likelihood, everybody who wants to shift to experience staging is already devoting a lot of their resources to service delivery. I will equate it metaphorically to being a radio station. They're not all wrong. On, they're just just off station. Their S's are coming in a little fuzzy. So what experience staging is and why it's possible for all of us is it allows us to step back and ask this question. What business am I really in? Okay, another question to ask along those same lines is this. What is the, what is the secret that I know as a human being that I'm secretly using my business to teach. So, generally speaking, I sell organization. Whatever. What's the real trick? What's the real secret behind what everything you do? And this ties into the last piece, which is this. The idea of getting everybody bought in. What's the purpose of the business? The objective of every business, including mine, even if I try to hide from it, is to make a profit and stay in business next year. That's my objective. That's yours too and everybody listening. But what's the purpose of my business? The mm -hmm. purpose of my business is the secret I'm trying to teach and I suppose in your world this is brand. What sure. the business represents and is about. So the question is when we all get excited and I'm going to, you know, when we all get excited about the purpose, then we all see opportunities to bring ourselves in our role to fulfilling that promise. What's a brand? Promise kept, promise broken. That's it. So everyone working for you, and this is a terrible thing to consider, until you realize that it's the truth, and while the truth might hurt, as soon as you accept it, you get on the other side of it, life is good, is this. Yeah. In all likelihood, there are people who work for you that already want to go in the direction of experience staging, and if, if you could all rally behind a purpose, they probably could bring some really good observations to you vis-a-vis, -vis, you know this thing you pay me to do, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? It's pointless. We could do this instead, and it would be much more meaningful. Yes. Yes. You're, you're spot on, Dennis. You use different vernacular, but, but it's the, uh, when, you, when you talk about brand, you talk about vision versus mission. Mission is what you do, and a lot of times you'll see in the cafeteria a sign that'll say, our, our mission is to be the largest seller of financial services in New Hampshire or something. But people go in the cafeteria every day and they say, wow, I am helping us become the largest. No, that just makes somebody else a bunch of money. What they want to see is a vision, which is a better state of affairs, a better world, that, that if you're successful with the, with the mission, you'll achieve, to your point, of purpose. So, so values, why I go to work, you know, what am I doing here? How do, I, how do I really do a good job for people? What, how to make it meaningful, not just money for other people. But the little job I do, or the big job, whatever the job is, is connected to some bigger cause, a bigger purpose, as you're describing. Correct. To me, branding from the inside out. And when you look at the experiences, not just for the, the customers and prospects, but also for the employee, I think that, that's the perfect 360 degree view of what's required, right? Because you always say one of the, one of the benefits of, of experiences is the employees who are inspired to go to work and be at work. Not just not just a job they have to have, but a job they really want. Absolutely. Absolutely. In experience world, what you're getting on about there is this idea of theme. And theme is not a mission statement. 
the mission statement you share with the world, right? Every, this is our mission. This is what we're trying to do for our clients. My mission at our little firm here is to inspire people to innovate and implement meaningful change in their life and business. And I and Tom and Susan are completely proud of that. We want everyone to know that's what we're here to do. Absolutely. Now we have a theme as well. And the theme per the experience economy, per Joe and Jim, informs the mission. That's what we're really all about. And what we're really all about here, am I going to share my theme, my secret theme to the world on the internet? <laughs> our secret theme is to make you all more Canadian. No, our, yeah. um, our secret theme is this. And when I told Tom Frisbee this, when I learned this and I phoned him and said, Tom, what's our theme? And he kicked it around and tried to figure it out. When I told him these words, he laughed out loud and said, beautiful. That's exactly what we are. Ready? Yeah. Business is fun. Yeah. Now, right. what does that mean? Does that mean we're goofy? No, absolutely not. Does that mean we take things less seriously? Than we... Absolutely. We're the most serious people going. But it informs everything we do in this sense. And some people listening in are here. And congratulations. Yes. Some people listening in are trying to get here. And this is this spot right here. Where you bring your business to such a place that you transcend ambition, making money, making more money, making even more money, securing yourself. You transition from ambition to meaning where suddenly the revenue isn't the revenue and it's not the prime driver and you don't that doesn't get you excited anymore what gets you excited is the work and the impact of the work so this is when you get there and i say this to you business business is fun yeah i could substitute fun for business is beautiful business is meaningful so everything that we do and how and we harmonize that theme when you when you phone our office as you know the telephone doesn't ring plays a song, okay, so that you could say, oh, that's nice, like, well, it is, it is nice, but that song is often tied to current events and meaningful things that our clients identify with. Yeah. We also don't ever have anybody answering, answering machine, we're, we're light and happy, we're positive, we make wonderful impressions. So getting your, client, getting your staff to buy into experience staging is to first get everybody on the same page answering the question, what business are we really in, and what specifically are we trying to... Who do we want our clients to become through engaging with us? Right, and and if you're successful at doing that, um, those customers will become raving fans for your your company as well. So they're like like going to Starbucks or, or Cabela's or one of these high end hotels. You're telling other people about the experience, and that's that is wonderful marketing. You couldn't even buy that. I mean, that's really authentic. Mm -hmm. Telling other people, go to this guy for your life insurance or whatever. Uh, so, mm -hmm. Dennis, we have, we have a couple of um, questions, and people feel free to send them in. Um, Jenny's asking, how would one get started? Which department should lead inspiration toward experience? I think you've sort of touched on it already. It's everybody's responsibility, but but um, where do you see it bubble up? Uh, is, it, is one of the things where the, where the CEO goes, we're, we're doing this, or or is it more coming you know, from the groundswell, from the rank and file, or is it all of those things? Yeah. It can come from either. I mean, in my world, I, I, I deal with a lot of owner operators. So it often comes from the top down. But every amazing team, every brilliant idea I've had, generally speaking, somebody put in my ear first. Often, Susan, here's an idea for you. What if we did this? What if we did that? So I think where it begins is I think it's I think it begins with a conversation. And whom I can't say specifically who should lead that conversation. Some organizations have directors of client experience now. But if you're a smaller sort of organization, I think it begins at your very next staff meeting, or and you make item one on the agenda: what business are we really in, and and what do we want our customers to become? And then, yeah. you know, I really believe that it starts right there. Okay. Um. Lloyd's asking, I think, I think we can maybe cut this another way because we've sort of answered it, but Lloyd's asking, how do you create a positive experience staging in a service business where the transaction is required, uh, i.e. insurance or example insurance, versus transactions that are optional, uh, such as coffee? 
Mm -hmm. And, okay. um, you know, I, I, I think, I, I just, I just think that, it, for example, in, in brokers, insurance brokers that I run into, who are selling, yes, many of them are selling coverages that are required. Life insurance really isn't required. I mean, yes, it is. But no mm -hmm. one says, um, oh, you're alive, you need life insurance. If you have a car, a house, a business, if you're a lawyer, yes, you need coverages by law usually to be in business, mm -hmm. to have a house, to have a car. And so, and so those, are, those are required things. So you, you've got to go mm -hmm. make, make a move to buy them versus life insurance, which is a different uh, situation. It's, it's, I find it striking how maybe 5 or 10% of the agencies and brokers I've run into, again, I'm sticking with insurance here, mm -hmm. are just better at, at, as you say, slowing things down and creating a unique experience where they, people say, I could probably go to 100 places for this policy, this car insurance. But I like these guys, you know? There's something about them. Now, what did they do different? They're selling a lot of the same thing. But there was something about the process, the friendliness, the, the questionnaire was easier, or just they, they really seem to care. I mean, they say things that have nothing to do with the stuff. It's the right. things around the stuff. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, so part of it is authenticity and the desire to stage a real experience. I had said something earlier, I'll say again. It's critically important that you understand that the experience has nothing to do with the offering, the good or service. That's re it's easy to say, okay, okay, I get it. Yeah. No, no, you're a human. You're going to go right back to it. So let me, it has, experiences are as different from services as services are from goods. So I'm going to borrow from Joe, Joe Pine, who's my Paul McCartney. I'm going to pour, borrow from Joe and use an example that he does. And this is what he uses, the, the example of the gumball wizard machine. And sometimes in conferences when I reference this, I'll see a light bulb turn on where I'll just see someone, oh, they've seen this before, and, and suddenly they realize they are more familiar with the experience economy um, than they might have realized. So here's where it is. Imagine everybody listening, Lloyd and company, that our business is selling gumballs. And lots of people sell gumballs, and they're all over the place. And we have a meeting to say, how are we going to make this better for the client? Remember value. We started with volume and efficiency. Right? If it's a good, it's like make the gumballs bigger, sweeter, cheaper. Nothing creates value like dropping the price. Don't sell them for 25 cents, sell them for a nickel. Um, as I say, make them bigger, make them chewier, chew them longer, blow bubbles longer, sweeter, put one in that's weird colored. Oh, that's the sour one. There's a little thrill for you. Okay? But we're talking experience. And what's experience about? The currency of experience is time. So, regular gumball machine. Dennis walks up, drops his quarter in the gumball machine, turns the lever, instant. There's the gumball. This is the answer that Joe Pine gives. And it's using this wonderful little exercise that they refer to as ing the thing, which, which once you're an experienced economy nerd, you do all the time, even by yourself, quiet in the car. It's terrible. It's a curse. So all of those answers I gave, bigger gumball, sweeter gumball, chewer, yada, 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 they all have to do with the good or the service. What they did with the gumball wizard machine was they made it even bigger, much larger gumball machine. They elevated it, and underneath they put a clear cylinder with a track on the inside, spiraling ING. Now you deposit your quarter, turn the lever, and instead of getting the gumball, very low level, you get show business. And if you really wanted to argue it, I would point out they've actually slowed down the service. They've slowed down the service. It takes longer to get the gumball. So back to Lloyd's question is, how do you experientialize somebody purchasing something they have to buy versus something they don't. And the question is, Lloyd, quit th the answer is quit thinking about the product and the paperwork. Start thinking instead of what it feels like to walk into your office. Mm -hmm. What does it feel like before they walk in? How have you prepared them? How have you customized, educated, entertained, and entertained them with just the materials you've sent? What have you done that's made them say, I'm looking forward to being there? When they transition 
into your office, what do they see? What do they feel? What do they experience? You should honestly I aspire that they don't even want to leave the lobby, that there's just something about being in the lobby that is pleasant enough that you would want to linger. So, so, so the answer is to think about instead the theme of what business you're in, what secret you're trying to teach. They're not here to buy optional insurance. That's just the goods and services. What's the secret you know you're trying to change, you're trying to teach them, and how can you stage that in this one area of your business which is just transitioning in? Yeah. So experience separate from service and good, goods and service. If I had some funding, I would start a show called Extreme Agency Broker Advisor Makeover. You know, <laughs> just go into these offices and, and create just something entirely different, it, which, by the way, the employees would love. Things like, you know, window treatments, new lighting, new carpet, flooring, flowers in the lobby, a latte machine, just evoking all the senses, which, by the way, Starbucks does very well, all five of the senses. Uh, like a bottle of champagne when you open it, it's all five senses. There's something about that. Create that environment. I don't know how many times people have said to me, we don't want walk-ins. We don't want people coming in here. You know, we want to be in a place where no one can find us. We want to go out and find people. We don't want to bring them in here. I see. I think that's a missed experience um, uh, opportunity to not have people come into your office. I know the the guy. Uh, you and I were talking about this earlier, but the, the one of the most successful State Farm agencies out in California mm -hmm. never made house calls, never made business calls. They all came into his office, sat in his office for a few minutes to chat, and then it was a, a staged handoff to a, to another agent. But it was all very staged. It was very sequenced. I said, "How did I said, how'd you get him to leave your office? Because some people just want to talk all the time, you know." He says, "I just get up, and about ten seconds later, they get up. And I walk to the door, and they follow me to the door. And I, and but this is how we became successful by selling car, home, and life insurance by creating this staged environment. So having people come to the office and talk mm -hmm. about stuff that's important to them, I think, is an experience, right?" And that's pretty obvious. But Absolutely. we're getting some questions about what are some other things you can do during a, a client review. Dave's asking what are, what are some things you, you might take a normal client review meeting uh, into a staged experience. That would be okay. a quick question for the staff, for Dave's staff, or or a company that in the situation to say, hey, if we were starting over, you know, let's 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 pretend we're starting this business. Today, that we don't have all these workflows and processes and, and software to manage accounts. We're just starting over today. How would we want to be treated? What would we? What, what do you think we? Our experience would want. We want it to be like, and and just create whatever title, whatever workflows you want. I mean, that's one way to look at it. Yes, and it would begin with the theme. It's not. Don't get stuck thinking about service. How would we want to be treated? It's how do we want to be treated? as it relates to our secret mission. Yeah. So I'm going to answer that question, specifically review meeting, and I'm going to give you two answers, just two ideas. And I should say, you know, you can phone me anytime, I'll talk about this all day long, but the first example I'm going to give is from an advisor who had nothing, <laughs> no money, no clients, nothing. He saw me speak, the next time he saw me speak, he comes up, and I'm like his hero. He's way too excited to see me. And this is the story he tells. No money, no office, works in a cubicle, nothing. He says, on the weekend, this is just to show you how little it can cost. He says, on the weekend, I'm at the dollar store with my daughter. Dollar store. And he sees, I just actually have one just like it in here somewhere. Dollar, dollar or dollar? <laughs> well... I'm in Canada, so I mean dollarettes. <laughs> I mean, in this case, though, it's your dollars, giant, big, powerful dollars. So um, he bought this glass bottle, a few of them, that has like a, a, like a stopper in the top, you know, a little porcelain lid, and it's got a hinge, and they're really lovely. You see them in restaurants. They fill them with table water, put them on the table. So he has no clients, no money, no budget, no nothing, no office, nothing. He sees these things. Even I can afford like seven bucks. So he buys a few of them, okay? Then he stages the experience. Before they ever come to the office, he reaches out to them, he reassures them, 
He sends them his pre-information kit, and his pre-information kit for this meeting has some value-added articles that have nothing to do with financial planning or the usual suspects. By the way, please see this article in New York Compound Interest. Nothing like that. It was more stuff on de-stressing and simplifying. This is really lovely stuff. They get to the lobby. He greets them. He doesn't let them check in. He makes it memorable, customized, and personable by being in their presence, which is something I say in every seminar. Receive them. Nobody should check in ever. They should be waited on. Mm -hmm. From there, this is does nothing. He brings them down the office. He brings them not. He has no office. He brings them to a little boardroom. On the table are folders with their names on it, customized and these beautiful bottles of water, which he said, I'd taken into the fridge, they were all condensation, they looked lovely, etc. A little tray of snacks, he's ready to go. The missus of the Mr. and Mrs. looks at the bottles and says, oh my gosh, they're beautiful. Like, oh, aren't they lovely? And they are. The fact they cost $2 doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is they are pretty. He said to me later, he says, and that was it. Right then and there, I knew. These people are going to be my client. Now, yeah. it's not the water bottle. It was this much bigger reason that he's doing it. And, his, and it was to connect and make people be healthy and live longer and be happier. This is his whole thing. So that, that's an example of one person taking the same idea of stages, attracting, or if you will, Kevin, enticing, entering, during, exiting, and extending, taking all those things. He has no money, using each stage to make it personable and meaningful. I have another client, not a client, I'm sorry, that's not true, an advisor that I know, we've never done any business together. His office is staged on one end with a dining room table and on the other with a living room right out of Ikea. And when I said to him, this looks like an Ikea living room, he said it's literally an Ikea living room. I took a picture of it and brought it to the first employee that I found and said, I want all of this. So. You, and I've gone to my own financial meeting where everybody was dressed up like it was a French cafe. Like I was in Paris. Berets, French dick, and a scarf around their neck. Like, what is that? It takes five minutes to do. I got a big kick out of it. You just got a big kick out of it. Some people listening are like, that's funny. It's funny and interesting because I had identified a trip to France with my wife specifically as a goal that was important to me. So it was recognized the next time, and at the time I said, oh, this is, uh, this is amazing. And he said to me, you think this is amazing? In two hours I'm turning this whole thing into a ski chalet. Mm -hmm. Like I'm staging a totally different experience for the next guy. So, <laughs> you know, again, think outside goods and services. Think instead delighting and engaging. Okay. All right, so some questions are coming in, Dennis, about the fact that in, in the financial services world, sometimes you have to deliver some bad news. Yeah. Um, a, a, a claim, a claim wasn't fully paid, or, or there was, uh, uh, let's say your your portfolio has shrunk a bit. Um, yeah. You were investing in, in Russian oil fields or whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so so how do you how do you handle those? those situations from an experience standpoint? It does it relate to that? Well, it always relates to it, I think, but there's a little bit of block and tackling there, which is, you know, client expectations and manage them in really, really good communication. I wouldn't suggest that, you know, you get a trombone. <laughs> I'm really sorry your poor clothes down. <laughs> you know, remember no, no. for all the wrong reasons. And Oba. Yeah, but I think that certainly, you know, a big part of that, as I say, is managing client expectations. Experience staging isn't all about, you know, when we think about experience staging, a lot of us think of Walt Disney, Disney World. So I want to caution you there, too. It's like, well, it's not always show business and pageantry. Right. Um, and it's not always good news and celebration. Experience right. is you're attentive, you're communicating, you're there, you're in front. The reality is that's, that markets go up and markets go down and, and, and those things happen. I, I, you know, I don't think that you would necessarily stage a different experience for that. It would just be a part of, of what you're doing. And again, that's, there's a little bit of hiding there, if I may say in that question, there's a little bit of hiding. 
Right. There's a little bit of, yeah, well, what if it goes wrong? It's like, well, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, sometimes it does. Right, uh, right. <laughs> you know. Right. So um, just a couple of other uh, objections. Uh, we're, we'll be wrapping up uh, pretty soon. We have, we have a number of questions. A lot of them are uh, a, a bit repetitive, Dennis, but um, we talked about some of the resistance you've run into, so I'm trying to get sort of sum up some of the questions. What's it going to cost me? I'm doing fine as is with the status quo. Things, you know, we're doing well. We're selling. We're doing well. A lot of our peers are not doing so well in this economy or in this market. We're doing fine as is. Um, I'm not. I'm not. I'm insecure about staging things that don't feel like they feel sort of fake. Is the third area you've addressed in the past. And then um, I don't have. I don't have the staff for it, which we talked about. So, so those those objections, Dennis. Um, Let's, did you go into a little bit more detail about how you overcome those and or why you should, you know, those are those are nice things to say, but it doesn't get it doesn't uh, doesn't mean you're not jumping into into experience economy. Yeah, well, I, there's a lot there. I think once again, let's start with this. I can't tell you how much it's going to cost because, as the old saying goes, I haven't seen the cow yet. You know what I mean? The old story about the veterinarian, what do you think's wrong? I don't know, I haven't seen the cow. So I can tell you this, I have no idea how much it's going to cost. Because I, I don't know enough about your, your business specifically. I believe that where you're looking for, the idea, the biggest hurdle to get over is this. When you say, it makes me nervous because it's fake. I completely appreciate and understand that. In fact, you can only do, and I'm going to use the example, we'll, we'll end on Starbucks as well. Okay. Starbucks only works because Howard Schultz is a beautiful human being who wants to change people's lives, period. At the heart of the experience economy is authenticity and generosity. Yeah. You cannot fake it. You can, but like everything else in your life, have you ever been able to fake it for long? No way. So people have to feel from you that this is important. And the only way you can do that is if you truly believe it. Okay, so I would say, like, start right there with, with, with what is honest and true. And the biggest then obstacle, as I said earlier, is opening yourself up to that, to, be, to, to becoming a being about something, more work that matters, instead, and, and looking to create value in that, in that way. Um, <clears throat> affordability and what am I doing already or if you will what we're already doing is working and why would I want to change because mm -hmm. at the heart of a successful business is innovation nobody ever wants to hear the story about we thought everything was going well and took our eye off the ball no way there must be innovation in a business it is, at the, it is the very essence of business success so even now, let's say that magically we all, we all take this big leap together. And there are tools and formulas to help us do this. When Tom and I work ourselves through this process, when we get to the very end, where, what do you think we do? Right back up to the start and we work ourselves down. You have to be constantly innovating because things are changing. So the one thing by experience staging that you can ensure does not change is the experience that you deliver. You can't control the markets if you're investors. You can't control the products if you're insurance. There's so much. We can't control global events. There's entirely too many variables that ultimately affect our goods and services. There's one thing that we control completely, and that is what it feels like to be under our care, even if um, you're delivering bad news. It doesn't yeah. matter. It's what it feels like to have Dennis care. Tom Care, Peter Care. That's 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 what it's about. Memorable events that are personal and and internalized. That that's what it's about. Right. And and you mentioned Howard Schultz, Dennis, um, the CEO of, of, of Starbucks. And I think you answered my other question by saying that he had the fire in the belly, has the fire in the belly uh, for the vision of, of the better world that he's trying to create with Starbucks. And so for any size firm, you got to have the, the top the top staff, the CEO, the C-suite, have that same fire in their belly. I mean, I remember I read this book called The New Brand World by Scott Bedbury. It's about Schultz. 
and there was one comment in there where one of the baristas says to Schultz, they run a tour about working on their core values, and 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 and, and he goes, he says to, to to Schultz, he goes, you know, boss, I used to think we were in the coffee business, that we we're just in the coffee business. He goes, now I see we're in the people business. We just happen to be serving, we just happen to be serving coffee. So if you think about that, you know, if we're in the people business, we just happen to be serving financial services. It really changes. It really changes a lot. Um, so Laura asked a, a good question about, from your standpoint, Dennis, what, is, what has been the most memorable experience that you've had? Um, I know you talk a lot about, uh, about your hotel journeys and, and how um, walking into the lobby, getting from the cabin to your room and that whole thing that's staged, but that may not be the best one you've ever had. Well, I'll tell you what. There's two things there. One is I want to say... Great, great question. I, I should have thought about that longer because I, of course, look for these things all the time, but, but I will get to it. Sometimes when we're talking business development or thinking business development and we're stuck thinking goods and services, we also get stuck thinking about best practices. What is this person that does what I do, 10 cities over or two states over or four provinces over, what does that person do and how can I do it and apply it to what I do? When we're thinking about experience staging and Starbucks and American Girl and Netflix and Uber, Bass Pro, Apple, W Hotels. What we're doing here is we're not looking for best practices. We're looking for best principles. We're identifying them and asking ourselves, how can I apply them to what I do? The most, the most memorable experience that's at least coming to mind right now, and perhaps I'm a little too stuck in, um, in hotels. I wrote a blog about this years ago. I called it Death. Uh, death in Kashmir, and I very briefly, very briefly, I arrived at the W Hotel on Lakeshore Drive in Chicago in February. Lovely. Nice. I nice. started the day sick as a dog, just like the, the mother of all colds, as we say, in Michigan. Late playing, you name it. When I walk into that lobby, looking good, fashionably dressed, but looking like death. This girl looks up at me and says, you do not look good. <laughs> I said, I don't, I don't feel well. So she says, do you want a cup of tea? I said, no. I'm, I said, I'm going to go to my room. I'm going to have a really hot shower and cook this thing, and then I'm going to room service. I tell her this. She says, okay. Up I go. Have a really hot shower. Can you picture it? I have a really hot shower. I call room service. And I say, hi, um, oh, I beg your pardon. I go up, I call room service, and I explain. I say, listen, I'm sick. I'm going to have a really hot shower. Then I'd like this. She says, yeah, I know. She already knew I was calling. Have the shower. A moment later, room service. In she comes. This is what's on the tray. A vitamin booster that somebody left the building to go to Walgreens to buy. She says, I got them to buy this. Okay. She says, I take this, whenever I'm sick, I take this. She tells me how to take it. Have two now, have two go to bed, yada, yada. I say, okay. There's a bowl of soup on the tray and a handwritten card from the chef who says, I hear you're not feeling well. This is what I make for myself. Da, 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 da. I hope you feel better. So I'm blown away. Keep in mind, this is what I do for a living. I'm like, where does this stuff come from? I'm blown away. <clears throat> I go to sign for the bill. There's no bill. Nothing. She says, oh, no. We just want you to feel better. Okay, so I'm... I don't know what to say. Thank you. And as she walks away, this is beautiful, she turns and looks over her shoulder at me and says, and you should be wearing socks, sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget it. And the W Hotel is an excellent example of an experienced staging business. They turned their lobby into a nightclub. I know, yeah. They turned it into a place you want to be, okay? Yeah. They're yeah. wired, they're wonderful, they're sort of witty, they make wonderful impressions. I stay in W Hotels every chance I get, but I'll never forget that story, ever. Oh. Well, Dennis, uh, one, more, one more quick question here. It seems uh, uh, somebody's asking Janet that it, that staging experiences seem to cost more, like certain hotels and Starbucks. So do you equate this experience economy, the ex staging experiences with higher revenue? Um, it's obviously more value to the customer. Is it more, 
Is it more costly for the customer? Is it more revenue for the owners that are staging these things? Is that generally true or not necessarily? Generally true. Generally. Okay. So this is something that we all know is true. In the app, price is only ever an issue with the absence of value. In the absence of value. So we all know that there's things that we love that we pay for that cost a lot of money and it's insignificant to us because of what it matters. So we already know that. We also, it also means, experience economy means that people are not only willing to pay more for experiences, they seek them out and they're willing to wait for them. So we know mm -hmm. that. However, I can think of something that I covet that's a complete experience economy and cost any, it's in fact remarkably cheap. And that would be, um, I would like to buy this very specific kind of little wooden boat. And a part of purchasing it is visiting the shop where they make them with their hands. It's like visiting a little garage where they're making handmade sports cars. I mean, it's absolutely beautiful. The place has been there 100 years. It itself is an experience. And as we're speaking about a specific thing, which is a boat, they're cheapest chips. They're the cheapest boats in the world. So there is a willingness to pay for experience and an acceptance that experience has value, it's providing those memorable events and customization. But you should not necessarily think that um, it has to be, not always, but certainly in the investment world with this DOL business and all the rest of it, absolutely, experience staging brings value. Value justifies cost, so yes. Okay. And sometimes no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, good webinar, right? Eh? I mean, I, I really, really enjoyed it. And we've got some excellent questions. Thank you, guys for sending those questions. I've got a bunch more here that we're going to have to email the responses to with your help, Dennis. For um, sure. So, I just saw a great one about digital reality, virtual reality roll by. So absolutely, I'll, I'll help you with those for sure, man. My pleasure. Business is okay. fun. Well, again, Dennis, thank you so much. And, and it's uh, MosleyWilliams.com if you want to learn more about what Dennis does. And we thank you so much for participating, Dennis. And thank you to our listeners and viewers for spending an hour with us today. Have a Thanks. great day, everybody. Right, man. I had a blast. Be well, everybody. Peace out.